Welcome back to what I think is the fourth installment in the Design a Product With Us series. We're designing the Picadev server module. And along the way, we selected a part. We did some coding with a, like a breakout board to just get some hello world out of that part to make sure we can use it. In the last episode, we did the hardware design and there was actually a two week gap because we were waiting for that prototype to come in. And it's my pleasure to inform you that we have prototype PCBs in the building. So in this episode, we'll assemble these and see what we can get working with them. As you can probably see, we're going full steam in the factory. We've also got a little bit of laser cutting that was happening in the background. So I apologize if things are a little noisier than usual, but this is a working space. Without any further ado though, let's assemble some prototypes and drive some servos. So we've busted out the trusty PCB alignment stenciling jig, just some FR4 material and some duct tape is all it takes to do a prototype stenciling. All you gotta do is line up that stencil and then tape it down in exactly the right spot and you've got a perfectly serviceable prototype stencil. Squeegeeing on the paste, the parts on this board are not super tiny, the smallest is an 0402 and so this setup works just fine for that. Now if you're ever gonna do any prototyping like this, if you're making one, you might as well make a couple. If something goes wrong for the first one, you've always got that backup in case the stenciling wasn't quite right or you just mess it up somehow. Doing that second in the same batch takes no extra time. Always good to start with the smallest components first. So here I'm starting with all the 0402 stuff just because it's small, it doesn't get in the way of placing other stuff. You can imagine if you put all the tall components on first, you'd have to place these tiny parts through like a labyrinth of a forest of all these taller components. So the next part is the PWM driver itself. It's a really big SOIC part, but again, it's not very tall. So it's nice to just get that out of the way. You can see a little bit of overspray on the pasting here. The pasting quality isn't super, super sharp. I think it's just a combination of that loose jigging and how runny the syringe paste tends to be. It's not gonna be a problem though. Once we hit it with the heat, that'll all pull in nicely. And we're finishing up with the bottom half of the board here, just putting on the JST connectors, the PicoDev connectors. On go the USB-C connectors. These are just for power delivery, so we can power the servos. And there are two of them because of course this should daisy chain. Next up, we've got the big reservoir cap because of course servers can draw a fair bit of current. Here I'm processing down a one by six Tiger Core header into two one by three Tiger Core headers so that we can use them on these prototypes. We have the one by threes on order currently, but since we've got the one by sixes, we just cut them in half. And so something that I raised in the last episode was that these are not rotationally symmetric headers. If you turn to this about 180 degrees, it would look like a uh, pin one left style header. And this is a pin one right style header in this format. And so we've created a footprint that can accommodate both. It does occur to me though, that if we didn't have a symmetrical footprint, we could kind of, if those are our headers, we could kind of have them snugged together a little closer and that might buy us a fourth connection. I know a lot of people on the forums have been talking about a fourth channel being a really nice idea. So maybe that's an upgrade we make to this prototype. So I've got parts down on two units and it's time to bust out the hot plate and solder them. These tiny MHP hot plates are marketed as like a preheating hot plate for hot air rework. So that you can have your board at a, an elevated temperature and then you can just bring in your hot air gun to rework them. They do an immaculate job for prototyping and just the whole reflow operation. Very, very useful. They are teeny tiny though. Uh, they're kind of the perfect size for like a single unit Pukadev module, like something that's a square module. For these longer ones, you can see I just kind of have it spanning the hot plate diagonally. That's just so it doesn't want to fall off quite so easily. And then I nudge it around to pull that heat around from one end of the board to the other so that everything solders. And it's always so pleasing to see when those little granules start to turn into a liquid and everything just aligns into place with surface tension. Very satisfying. And just giving the board a once over, looking for any problems that we can catch now. If something needs to be reflowed, we can reflow it and say, open a closed bridge or something like that. Rinse and repeat for the second unit and you've got two prototypes. And here they are, two assembled prototypes that are ready for bench testing. Obviously a good idea first to beep it out with a multimeter, you know, just check that there's no continuity between power and ground, make sure there are no dead shorts on the circuit, lest you let out the magic smoke. These capacitors as well, when they go, 
they really go. So making sure they're around the right polarity is super important. If you've ever reverse polarized an electrolytic cap and had it explode on your desk, it's surprising and unpleasant. Don't recommend. Look, there's nothing else for it but to fire it up and drive a servo. I will plug it in and we ought to get a green light. All right, so we at least have power and ground the right way and nothing is blowing up on the board. Let's see if we can detect this device. I've got my Python REPL and we can just do an I2C scan. So from machine, we need to import pin and I2C. We want to create an instance of the I2C bus and set it up on bus zero with SDA equal to pin eight. You get the drill. SCL, you got a pin nine. And then we want to execute I2C scan. Whoops, I2C equals I2C. And there it is. We have our device appearing at its default address, which is 64. This is a secondary address that we kind of get rid of once we initialize the device. We can talk to our servo controller. Since we can talk to it, this should behave exactly the same way as when we ran the hello world code from earlier on in the series. This is that code. Last time on the factory, we created a class for the PCA 9685. We're basically just writing bytes to registers to get the thing set up in a way that we can drive servos. There's some really basic helper functions. We initialize the hardware, we initialize the I2C driver. And then in an infinite loop, all we do is on channel zero, we're setting the off time because we're changing the pulse width just by changing the off time. And, and I was able to get a, a server moving back and forth. And so theoretically, this should be no different. Oh yeah, our other test, I mean, wasn't exactly complete because I still have to connect the high current five volts. And I mean, you could do this with a low a, a bench power supply with uh, current limiting, but I've beeped it out. Everything seems to be on the right way around. Famous last words. I think we're good. Now this code is driving channel zero. That's channel zero of this chip. And in our schematic, that correlates to position number three, servo channel three, as indicated by the silk artwork. Plug the servo in the right way. Okay, so far so good. And I guess we just hit the run button. Huh? Yeah, that's what's up. How good. It's, it's doing the thing. It sounds, sounds kind of annoying. All right, I'll stop that. Just for extra annoying points, we'll drive two servers at the same time. Uh, I guess we want to connect to Silk Servo 1. That's actually channel 2 on the chip. Channel 2 on the chip. Two servers at the same time. Ready, set, go. Nice. Okay, so you, you maybe can't hear it in the video. We experienced this issue last time and this comes down to the differences between servo builds. This one, this one is vibrating quite a lot and I think that has to do with our carrier wave frequency. Whereas this servo is totally happy. And so of course our library is going to need some kind of way to change that frequency so that it can work nicely with different brands of servo. I think this is still using 200 Hertz. 50 Hertz would be way more sensible. Now, of course, Picadev is a daisy chained ecosystem. What if we want our fourth servo? We need to bring in our second driver and daisy chain them together. So let's set that up now and make sure that works. Mm, mm. So it would appear in my haste in our design episode. You may recall when I was laying out the schematic, 
I, I didn't know if it was, it was just in a moment of excitement. I was doing the prototype, I wanted to get it done, shooting the factory episode. I just tied all these address pins to zero. Just like, oh yeah, we know the address. It's the default address. I didn't include a provision on the prototype to change the address. So we're gonna have to bodge this board to give it a different address because otherwise they'll both just be on the same address. That's no good. We can't individually control servos between boards. They'll both just behave exactly the same. Be right back. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is go for, I'm gonna bodge pin A4 to be high. And the reason I've picked A4 instead of A0 is on the circuit board, here we have pins, what is it? We have A0 through A4 on pins one, two, three, four, five. And then A5 is randomly on pin 24. That puts all the address pins on the chip in this top right corner here. Zero, one, two, three, four. Here's, here's address pin four. And I'm picking that one because I think there's the fewest amount of cuts to do. You can see this ground is just connecting all the pins together. I'm just gonna cut this ground right here, pull it up to voltage, and we'll have changed the address. Bust out the Stanley knife, and very carefully with this very large knife, just trying to cut that trace between the pins. That's all it's gonna take. Just because things are a little bit hard to see, bust out the multimeter, do a continuity test to make sure that we're decoupled from ground and we're, we're still connected to ground. It appears that in my, in my haste to find a nice simple solution, I missed this bit right here. Look at this. There's a ground fill that just sneaks in and connects to the pad. And in fact, that's underneath the chip. There's no way that I can, that I can cut that trace. And that's present on every one of these pins, except pin one. Pin one is the only pin where I'm gonna have to go cut, cut, cut. It'll isolate pin one, which I think is address pin zero. I can isolate it with three cuts solder a wire to go to VCC, and now we'll have changed the address. And so we're back in the saddle, we're back under the microscope with the Stanley knife, cut, cut, cut. Things are looking kind of messy at this point. There's mask and there's copper being peeled back, giving it a brush to try to, try to see if things are looking good. And it looks okay, it looks like we're ready to go. I beep it out again with the multimeter, still connected to ground. How is this possible? I don't know, I don't know where it is, but, I'm over it and I'm going to bust out the soldering iron and I'm just kind of, I'm going to lift up that pin. I'm going to desolder just that pin and try to lift it up. Then we can take some wire wrapping wire and just solder it between VCC and now this, this air pin. And you know, nothing looks good under a microscope. Every, every little thing looks so much worse under a microscope, but in the flesh, at one to one size, it's looking all right, and hey, it's a prototype. All right, same again. I'm gonna unplug my first module. That's this guy, he's going down. We've got the second module with the dodgy bodgy wire. We'll plug that in. I've already plugged it in, I know it's not gonna blow up, it's fine. <laughs> and we need to get back into Thony, and we'll do that same signs of life test that we did the first time. Last time we got an address of 64. This time, we're looking for an address 65, there it is, our unconfigured device, address 65, and that's the, I guess, like the, the sub address that you can use as well. So we have two modules, two unique addresses. It's time to drive two boards at the same time. So I have my two boards connected to the Pico. We have the first board and the second board with the bodge. Connects my power to the first board. We need to loop power to the second using a USB-C to USB-C. Now for the servos. I've got my big servo. I'll put that on channel one of the first module. And my other servo, we'll put that on channel two of the second module. Okay, so what do we need to do in code? We need to initialize our second module. So I'll call the first one driver A, and I'll call the second one driver B. And this time we'll pass in address equals 65 decimal. 
Uh, don't know what that is in Hacks at the top of my head. Let me know in the comments if you do. Haha, <laughs> sick call to action. <laughs> okay, driver A, we're on the first channel. So that's, that's two. And driver B, we're on the second channel. That's on pin one. I'll just copy that, paste it down here. So these 2000. So we're going for independent control of two servers, each on a separate PWM driver board, different address. Moment of truth. I promise I haven't done this one before. Hey, that's it. Hmm. It's pretty pleasing. Oh, I had my doubts there for a little while <laughs> trying to, with the with the amount of hardware budging for that second module, trying to get that to work. That's very gratifying to see. And look, I think it's always important to finish on a win, so I'm going to leave it there. We've got two unique servo drivers that can each drive three servos. I can see a few improvements that I want to make to the board. Of course, we've got to work on the code. We've got to make an actual API that's easy to use. But I can already see a few improvements to the board. We discussed maybe putting in that fourth channel. If we can sneak in a breakout header as well, that'd be great because this is this is not just a, like a pick out of board now. This with a breakout header, this could be useful to loads of makers. I'm not exactly sure what the shape of the next episode is going to take. Maybe we'll work on creating a beautiful, easy to use pick out of library. But in any case, keep your eye out for the next revision. And until next time, thanks for watching.